Hey, good afternoon. We are going to proceed and get started today. And uh, I know most of your faces already because we just had lunch together. And in fact, Ian and I, already we've already had our own session. And uh, we'll just invite you guys to, to join in with us as well. My name is Richard Williams. Um, you may know me through my famous tennis daughters, Venus and Serena. Um, <laughs> It was an honor to have Will Smith play me. And <laughs> no, no, silly. Uh, this is my fifth year at School of the Ozarks. This is my 14th year to be in Christian education um, after a 20-plus year in church ministry as uh, the choir guy and the worship guy and even the pastor guy for a while. But uh, exactly where I need to be right now, having the best time of my life. And uh, so we're glad that you're here. I want to pray for us, and we'll dive right in. Uh, Father, the psalmist reminds us that uh, you're good and that your mercy endures forever. We are privileged to be in this place today, Father, and I just thank you for these other men and women, Father, who love teaching, uh, who have a love of the fine arts, uh, who love their students. And more than anything today, Father, we just pray that this would be a time that not only brings honor and glory to you, but would bring in some way encouragement to everyone that's sitting here. Father, I know that sometimes um, being in a fine art you may be separated from everyone else, and uh, sometimes there's not a lot of camaraderie um, just by virtue of distance. And we pray that we would feel some of that today as well. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you most of all for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Mrs. Edwards, would you mind grabbing a water for me? Would you kindly do that? Thank you so much. I had it in my hand when I walked out of my room and left it. Uh, becoming more classical, and it's just that. It is a term that we hear often uh, from our headmaster, who basically says, hey, Whatever you're doing, keep doing it, and anything that you can do to make it more classical, then you know, we're good with that. And so Wesley and I both had to kind of come to grips with what does that look like? What are we doing? Are we moving in that direction? And so for our time today, um, I'm going to talk uh, in a short art session about establishing a solid program structure, then kick it off to Wesley, and then back to me, and then we'll end with Wesley uh, one more time. Uh, so this is visual art, establishing a solid, solid program structure, and this is kind of my art life verse. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, School of the Ozarks was started, uh, officially restarted, I should say, uh, in 2012 as a high school only. Uh, Mr. Dolliff has already told you, uh, don't, don't do that unless you just have to. But it is where we started. Um, and so a four-year high school and for fine arts, uh, we had three individuals who came in as adjuncts who all had 20 to 25 years or more of experience teaching in public school and now were retired. And so out of retirement, they came Christians all. Um, but we really just kind of said here, this is our classical Christian school and here's fine arts and we're just going to go and just kind of stick it on there in some way and, and hope that it, that it sticks. Um, two years later, we opened the lower school, which was K through six only. Uh, hired a full-time uh, person to teach kindergarten in the morning and then just, just lower school uh, art in the afternoon. And she brought a wonderful um, classical uh, thought line to, to what, were, what was already going on. And then the next year, I added seventh and eighth grade. So the lady who was teaching high school art also was adjuncting and teaching junior high art. And then we had somebody who was doing double duty as kindergartner and also as, as an elementary art instructor as well. And then within two weeks of one another, uh, those two ladies decided to resign. Uh, one, because uh, she got pregnant and just thought it was time to be mom for a while after a three-year stint of teaching with us. Uh, and then the other, uh, her, husband, uh, her husband, her son was involved in a very uh, uh, terrible accident. Um, his wife was expecting their first child at eight months already, and she just felt like she needed to go be a mom for him. So I was hired 
uh, to come in and take it all. Uh, they asked if I wanted to teach kindergarten too, and I'm like, uh, no, not on your life. But I'll just, I'll take, I'll take the, I'll take the art side, and you can find somebody else. And they did. In fact, we have an absolutely fabulous uh, kindergarten instructor and stuff. But I did tell them at lunch I do have a whistle because I do have kindergarten recess one day a week for 20 minutes, and that's enough. That is enough. Uh, so when I got here, uh, not knowing really what the whole classical thing was about, I taught in Christian school and Christian uh, Christian education and Christian art uh, for five years at the time. At the time, um, I just had two different pieces of the puzzle that were not connected with one another as far as the umbrella of visual arts were concerned, and I just felt like I needed to have some way, some way to pull all that and hold that, hold all that together. Um, and so I just fell back on an old and known. Um, system called discipline-based art education, which involves art production, art history, art criticism, and aesthetics. And I saw that word aesthetics, I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a great classical word, <laughs> word. And so I just kind of honed in on that and, and what that, that meant and was just like, okay, that's just kind of, it's, it's a hook and we're going to use it uh, to go uh, from there. Um, and so that kind of became my umbrella for all that we were going to do. Um, and then I just had figured out what am I going to teach as far as uh, art-wise. Uh, we are intentionally Western civilization focused. I know that the whole rage for everybody else in progressive education is to teach globalism. And we just don't because there's too much, too much to teach out there. And because we do try to stay somewhat uh, affiliated or lined up with what our students are doing in their regular classrooms as far as uh, history and timeline. And we're getting to do more and more of that as time comes along. So then, um, yep, the main thing was just starting at the grammar, at the grammar stage. We're doing elements of art, we're doing principles of design, line, shape, form, color, value, texture, space, I'm bringing in my kids in here and think, so these are the elements of art. I can name them part by part. Line, shape, form, color, value, texture, space, clap. I can name them loudly, proclaim them, each one in its place, huh, all right? <laughs> There's one for line and shape and form, and that's as far as I've got. All right, uh, color's kind of hard, um, but that just kind of is the overarching structure of what it is uh, that we are teaching. If you need it, uh, Inasco makes a wonderful set of posters of those uh, seven, uh, seven and seven, and uh, we have the disciplines of art, but we don't the principles of design, but we only have the others as well. Um, so then from there, what do I do with this? And so this became kind of my process for selecting projects. What do we do? How do we accomplish what we're after in there, specifically thinking about art production and art history? Um, and so obviously, where does it fit within the elements of art and principles of design? Um, is it historically significant in some way as far as the artist and what they brought uh, to the scenario, so if I can make that kind of a connection and the fact that what we are doing um, is borrowing ideas from a known artist historically, that's helpful. Um, a big one here, and hopefully it is for you too, is things, anything that can be done cross-curricularly, and sometimes that depends on, on your regular classroom teacher and how much they want to do with that. And I've got one or two that are very vocal about that, and we collaborate all the time back and forth about what we're doing and what they would like for us to do, and for the others, I just kind of pick some things and don't say anything to them, and I don't say anything to the kids about it e either, but when those moments of connection happen, and they go, oh, we were just talking about that in class the other day, and uh, it's exciting, because then they go run back, and they tell the teacher everything anyway. So uh, looking for many of those opportunities as possible. Uh, proper sequence, obviously some things need to be done before other things, and I really hadn't thought that through a whole lot, other than the fact that when COVID hit, and all of a sudden we pulled up stakes and we did the rest of school for six weeks at the end of the year uh, at home. And so the next year rolls around and my third graders are doing a one point perspective drawing using colored pencils and they're having to layer one color on top of the other. And they looked terrible. They were so bad. And I'm like, what is up with that? Do you guys even know? Yeah. You know those six weeks that we went home last year? Yeah. Yeah, that was going to be some of the time when we actually talked about 
how do we we'll draw and use color pencils and how we do that layering. So I, they didn't know what they didn't know. And uh, so sequencing helps. And then the other thing that I popped in, uh, it's called sketch versus the real deal. That's my kids always want to know. Mr. Williams, is this a sketch or is this the real deal? You know, <laughs> why? And sometimes they can tell, it depends on what paper I'm giving them. You know, if, they, if they're getting copy paper, then it's probably a sketch. But if they're getting nicer drawing paper, then it's probably uh, the real deal. But I've tried to implement, implement that amongst um, many of the projects that we're doing. Because especially if they're learning a new technique, it's kind of nice to have an opportunity to practice it just a little bit. Um, and I can say that over time, uh, the, the final results do, do wind up looking better. I think the, the students are pleased or more pleased with what they accomplish. So that's kind of the big picture of what we're doing and how we do it on the art production, our history side of things. And then the other side is uh, art history, art criticism, and aesthetics. So art production probably takes up 80, 85% of what we do time-wise in the regular classroom. And then if I try to find some neat ways, can, can we package this uh, history and criticism and aesthetics all together? Because they are kind of related and we can talk across from one to the other. Um, and so I was aware of, of close looking and Stephen Turley talks about gazing and others talk about doing a deep dive. Um, but I wound up taking a, a class online through MoMA and then through uh, Cindy Ingram, who is the art class curator um, in which she presented visual thinking strategies. Um, and so that kind of became my catch-all for taking care of those other, other aspects. Um, and so it's an opportunity um, just to kind of get students to go beyond what they simply see to do a deep dive into the meaning of, of artwork. And you really don't have to have a whole lot of background information to be able to do that. Um, Three questions for the students. What do you think is going on in this picture? And so basically they'll team up with a partner and they'll have um, a color print printout of what that looks like. And then up on this side screen, there'll also be a version of the artwork. So what do you think is going on in this picture? Um, what do you see that makes you say that? And then what more can you find? So it's pretty simple. And it really is. But the cool thing is, is that we're hardwired for, hardwired for stories, and so we create and consume stories every day. And we have a tendency to remember them easier and in more detail than just plain facts. And so this all really hangs on this whole idea of interpretation with justification. Really what makes this so powerful is that what do you see that makes you say that? That's the key question. And so by constantly asking students to learn to look for contextual clues and artistic choices and elements that they have, may have missed otherwise, it begins to add layers to their interpretation. It's the power of the word because, because they kind of have to answer that away. Well, Mr. Williams, I think this da 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 is what's going on in this picture because, and now they have to give me visual evidence from the, from the image that supports what they say. And it's great because they begin to open up to the art and they make their own personal connections and they are honing their communication abilities, critical thinking, reasoning, some early logic. And so the benefits are astounding. And I've discovered that once you establish that um, as a part of your ongoing artwork discussions, um, then the kids see that as normal and it's fun and they'll want to work at work, um, look at them and they want to do it more. I do this once a month um, with eight different classes. So I have first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, junior high and high school. And over two days we spend time looking at the same image all, you know, based in that class. And it comes with its own different mix. Obviously we're going to discover some things differently from first grade up into the junior high. Um, but the cool thing is this is that everybody comes at that artwork with their own lens of personal history and experience. And for me, as long as they can back that up, they're they can back up their interpretation with evidence from the artwork, then there's no wrong answer, right? So this is one that we've looked at before, and I talked about it a couple of years ago. This is Caravaggio's Supper at Emmaus from 1601. This is the moment in which Jesus is blessing the meal, and the two disciples that have spent the day walking with him realize that, oh, it's the Lord, you know, and so you see their reaction. Well, my kids, they don't get the title. They don't get to know who it's from or when it's from. So just based on what they see, they have to determine what's going on. So 
here's what I've got with this. So this is the story of a fisherman telling about his latest catch. And his friend is jumping up in astonishment as to how big the fish was. And then his wife is like, yeah, I've heard it all before. All right? So that was a fifth grade observation. Uh, somebody else said, well, uh, this is the daughter, and she's presenting her boyfriend to the father, and the father's going, no way! And the boyfriend's jumping up in protest. All right? So, but I get it. I could see, and they were able to justify their meanings as a result of that. And so it's just giving them the space and the freedom to work out their own interpretations of the artwork. And uh, the discussions have been deep, and they've been vibrant. And I shared we looked at two different crucifixion pictures with first graders, some for whom it was difficult for them to look at that. And I just had them turn it over, and it was OK. You don't have to look at that. But then to have a talk with them about what is beautiful and what makes this beautiful. And for them to be able to discern shades of difference of meaning in the way that we use that word uh, was just remarkable. Uh, the only other caveat that I would have is that <clears throat> for us, especially being classical Christian, um, often there is a particular interpretation as far as the artwork is concerned, something that comes either historically or through the artists themselves. And if I'm using the image in that art history context, then I, I've got to present that. I've got to share that with my students, hopefully giving them the best meaning and the best understanding of that context. Um, and that may be just scaffolding a few more questions to uncover that um, on top of everything. Um, but it's not, um, it's not a relativistic free-for-all, you know, where everybody gets a trophy when we're done, all right? Um, but for me, uh, this, uh, this is the dream, all right? Uh, my emphasis is in painting, but I'm an art history guy, art history guy through and through. Um, and I would do this as often as I could or as often as the kids would let me do it. But it is a dream. It celebrating this process of diving into an artwork together and just delighting in the students as they show their creativeness. And I would just strongly recommend this particular book to you, uh, 75 Masterpieces Every Christian Should Know by Terry Glaspie it is not just artwork, but there's music and movies and literature that are involved in as well. But this kind of began, became the basis a number of years ago as we launched into using visual thinking strategies. So I'd encourage you to do that. If you find your way into our auditorium at the end, the walls have recently been, um, we've got prints, uh, canvas prints of masterworks, um, and most of those came from there as well. So. I'm going to turn you over to the very capable Wesley Saunders. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, so to, to start off my section, I uh, just want to introduce myself briefly, Wesley Saunders. I'm a product of the classical model. I, I came out of the Logos School, the flagship ACCS school in Moscow, Idaho. And um, uh, uh, Doug Wilson was my pastor. I went to Christ Church. That's the church I went to growing up. So it's a pleasure to be here. And um, just so you know, I'm, I'm not always, I, I try to tell my colleagues this, I'm not the ideal example that maybe some of my peers may have been a, a better example coming through the, the, the ACCS model. So just just know that um, we're, we are all uh, human and we're all working and, and fashioning our hearts closer to God, right? So anyway, um, for the music part, um, just to give you a, a little history of my training and experience, I... Um, uh, was brought up in a, a very musical family, which I was very thankful and blessed uh, to be a part of. And then uh, college time, uh, I didn't go to New St. Andrews, where most of my siblings went to. I had to go the public route because they didn't have a music education degree. So I went to the University of Idaho. I got a kindergarten through 12th grade uh, choral music certification. And then I went to Mississippi for my master's degree in vocal performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, to your degree down there, we did a lot of opera and theater. Yep, Southern, Southern Miss. Um, Dr. Polk, he teaches here. He went to Southern Miss as well in Mississippi. And, um, and then I had about a year and a half, two years career of doing a variety of professional performing opportunities from um, yeah, performing to conducting and uh, doing lessons full time and all kinds of things. You know, when you're an artist and you think about the finances, you have to be creative, right? Literally, <laughs> in, in every way, creative. So anyway, but we, we made it happen. I'm surrounded by another uh, fellow uh, performer here, Bray Wilkins. He's in Wichita. He, he knows the life of a professional performer as well. 
Okay, anyway, so let's jump into music here. Um, I just want to ask the question, what does it mean to be more classical? Just to give us a framework from where we're, we're coming from. So uh, I pulled this, uh, to answer this question, I, I pulled a great quote from Clark and Ravi's The Liberal Traditions, um, and so hopefully it'll give us some clarity. This full-orbed education aims at cultivating fully integrated human beings whose bodies, hearts, and minds are, form are formed respectively by gymnastic, music, and the liberal arts, whose relationships with God, neighbor, and community are marked by piety, whose knowledge of the world, man, and God fit harmoniously within a distinctly Christian philosophy, and whose lives are informed and governed by a theology forged from the revelation of God in Christ Jesus as it has been handed down in historic Christianity. If we are in the business of shaping loves and aesthetics, and we want to be more classical, it therefore follows that we want what God wants. And so we must ask the question, what is it that God desires of us within the context of music in this situation? And so when we think about what role singing should play in our lives, there will probably be no other activity that will fill our heart and soul with God's word and spirit more than with singing. For this reason, we see the necessity of training all of our students as worshipers in preparation for the day that each one comes into an effectual faith in Christ. The ACCS states, We do all things to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our ultimate mission is the cultivation of students as worshipers. And if we know as catalogically as Revelation tells us that singing is one of the things we will be doing in heaven without a doubt, then it would seem that music should be central to how we train up our children in the love and admonition of the Lord. It is my belief that we must purposefully have a Christian and classical model of music education all the way from the bottom to the top. And as a, result, as a result, our home and school culture will be one where music and singing is looked forward to with joyness. And with joyness is a very important point, as it, dovetail, as it dovetails very well into the classical philosophy, but also the, the model by which we do music education here at SFO. Colossians 3.23 tells us, Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men. This is a great uh, example of the enthusiasm that we have here at School of the Ozarks. This is my first grade class, and uh, they, they bring the enthusiasm, Mr. Williams knows. So anyway, um, yeah, I just, it's, it's a great photo summing up. Okay, so um, as far as enthusiasm goes, that was a great example. Now, I want to talk briefly on the public school model, which typically views music as a non-core elective after elementary school. This is contrary to God's command to us. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. Psalm 100, verse 2. God did not say, sing to the Lord with a cheerful voice if you kind of feel like it today. Singing is also not auxiliary. God is a God who sings. So singing should be one of, if not the, central means by how we worship him. The current state of music of the contemporary church and our Western culture at large, at its best, is immature. It's funny that we sing in the last verse of Amazing Grace. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. But we set up often our school culture as if to sing, we've no less days to do math, Latin, and biology. If a culture desires and loves musical maturity in Christ, there must be instruction in a classical Christian way from kindergarten through the senior year. But this just doesn't simply happen. The cultivation of rightly ordered affections, specifically within the context of music, is the result of purposeful planning and execution. So you might ask, okay, what do you do? Good question, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> the goal of music education is the joyful music literacy of all students for the glorification of God. They should be trained to read, write, play, and sing. At School of the Ozarks, we use the Kodai method. It's, it's pronounced Kodai. Kodai. Try with me. Kodai. Kodai. Try it again. Kodai. Kodai. Good job. I'm exemplifying, giving the example, and you're imitating me. Well done. <laughs> so, very yes, very classical. That's right, yeah. 
Uh, the approach is language-based, which means that in the early years, there is a grammar-like approach to singing and making music. Initial teaching of hundreds of songs by hearing, rote, and for the student-based uh, hearing and rote and reading, and which provides a collection of material that can be sequentially used and contextualized for the, stu for the student based on learning ability and age. So Zoltan Kodai, he's the gentleman that I have pictured here, and he came from Hungary, and um, he did this uh, philosophy in Hungary, and he transformed the whole country of Hungary into a music literate country over the course of 30 to 40 years, two generations of teachers who he trained and taught over that course of time. And um, the approach uh, that Kodai has here, he says, teach music and singing at school in such a way that it is not a torture, but a joy for the pupil. Instill a thirst for finer music in him, a thirst which will last for a lifetime. And that's exactly what we want to do with our children, especially in the years of kindergarten through sixth grade. Awaken wonder, right? And so we want to do this in the context with music, especially. This is precisely what the classical philosophy pursues, to develop one's passions in a way so that they would grow a lifelong love of learning. And after all, love is the chief virtue that binds all others together, Colossians 3.14. And of the course, and of course, the two greatest commandments are the love of God and love of neighbor. We want our children to love music for their entire life. Sound and rhythm are taught by active participation in singing and making music, followed by learning to phoneticize, to phoneticize them through the use of solfege. And then this active approach to learning in the Kodai classroom also parallels with God's command to us to be doers of his word and not hearers only. That is to say, the student will not be simply told about music, but rather actively engage in the joyful process of music making. And um, uh, Dr. Polk made the point earlier that uh, having a passive experience with education in music is one of the major flaws in our modern culture's way of passing on knowledge. Passive, meaning you don't do anything about it. You sit, it's told to you, and let's just hope the sponge soaks it up. But we know very well that if you actively engage in this process, you're going to assimilate, it becomes part of you, and yeah, the list goes on. So anyway, I want to show you a clip here of an example of some of this music making. And I'm, let's see if I can play this from here. Here we go. Very excited. So that was one example of just a joyful music making process. And uh, this is my second grade, I believe. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's a little, that, that was one of the songs that you do for second grade, Bow Wow Wow. It uses do mi so, 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 la, so, mi, do, mi, re, do. And um, it's, it's the right time for their brains to use it. And so it's part of that, uh, part of the development within the Kodai uh, method. And I get into the Kodai method a little bit more here in a second. So Kodai and the classical Christian education. The outworking of the, of the Kodai philosophy in the context of the trivium would look something like this. First, you have grammar, kindergarten through sixth grade. That would be the stage when you would learn the basic elements of music, rhythm, melody, harmony, etc. Second, you have the dialectic, seventh and eighth grade, junior high, learning how the elements are used to create music, which we would call theory, right? And then third, the rhetoric phase, ninth through twelfth grade, learning how to assess, perform, and create skillful music. Since we are what we sing, the musical content we choose should also be worthy of our time, which is to say, edifying to our heart, mind, and soul, and honoring to God. This idea is very opposed to what we often see in public schools, which is simply just to create a good performance. In respect to content, hymns, and spiritually grounded poetry, and contemporary Christian music, which all of those most certainly have their rightful place. But at the end of the day, Singing God's Word should always be our primary source of song literature. Augustine and Calvin are fantastic authors, but they are not scripture. An excellent music program is a result of teaching and engaging in God's objective beauty. One of the things that we do is we sing some of the psalms to music. And so in kindergarten, they, they have started the process of um, 
our teacher teaches the catechisms with melodies. And so that's just one of the myriad of ways that we use melody as a way for a memory hook, right? We all know that well, if you remember the song and the melody, you will often remember the lyrics with the song. And so that's one of the things that we do. And I think that's the end of my first section. So I'll pass it off to the next one for art. Thank you. One thing I wanted to remind us of is that we all come from uh, unique situations and that God is building and crafting schools in many, many different ways. And so our journey as a school may look one way and I'm sure that yours is quite different. We recognize that when I was in pastoral ministry it was back in the time in the 90s when this whole mega church movement became uh, very popular and they wanted you to come to their church for a conference and they're going to tell you how they got to the size that they got. And I learned real quickly that I can't just take what happened in your situation and layer it on top of my situation and think that it's going to produce the same results. It will not. But are there some principles, some general biblical type principles that you were using that I can use in my situation? And so that's kind of what we're about here as well. I want you to know that uh, there is no secret family recipe. There are no secret sauces or anything like that that we're holding back from you. Um, as the man said, if my bullets fit your gun, go for it. <laughs> Use them. Use them. This is called the School of, Oz of the Ozarks Portrait of a Graduate. It is a document that kind of encapsulates based on our five uh, core values or pillars at the school as to what it is that we want a graduate to look like when they leave this place. And so when I was first presented with it, I kind of had to do a little bit of head scratching because I don't know that I had defined that question uh, for me um, as an art instructor. So what does a portrait of a graduate from the School of the Ozarks look like as the terms of visual arts? And um, that's still being formulated. I don't have anything uh, concrete that I'm ready to commit to paper uh, just yet. But it did force me to begin to, to thinking about that. And what it's done for all of us is that we actually start at the top down. If this is where I want my students to be when they leave, how do I get them there? What is that process and stuff? So there are some aspects in which I'm building from the bottom up, but now this is very much a top down thinking um, is how do I set them up for success to be able to attain those goals. One of the things that we do get to do because we are part of the Missouri State High School Activities Association um, is that we have a conference of schools from this general area, seven different schools. There are two Christian schools, us being one of them, and the other five are public schools. Um, so we play each other in athletics and other things that go on. And one of the things we, that we do do on the art side of things is that we have an annual art show, which is kind of like the track and field version of, of art. So basically students get to submit, or schools get to submit, up to 50 or 60 pieces in 25, 26 different categories um, that then are adjudicated and you're scored points for first, second, third place, honorable mention. And then we add up all the points and the school with the most points wins kind of thing. Um, so consequently, I reserve uh, the first nine to 12 weeks of the second semester for that activity because that becomes a student choice type activity where they can pick and kind of choose what kind of uh, project that they want to work on. And what I discovered um, is that 85% um, or more of the artworks that they're creating find their genesis in drawing. If you want the artwork to know, you got to draw well and learn to draw well. Um, and so looking back again at my discipline-based art, art education, being Western civilization focused and elements of art and principles designed by the discovered that we need to do next as far as trying to become more classical, and it'll be a little bit clearer in just a minute is that things need to become more drawing-centric than they are. Um, and I fought that a little bit. <laughs> because, um, you know, I remember being in college and being in my drawing classes and I didn't want to have to draw. I remember sitting in a computer art class and I just wanted to do it digitally because it was easier for me to do it that way. But we need to become decidedly drawing-centric and so this whole question of why I learned 
to draw on. I love this quote. The plain truth is that no one, no one cannot learn the things that one needs to know to become a good artist until one has learned to draw well. Drawing is the key that will open the doors to everything else. There's no way around it. That's Fred Roth from the Art Renewal Center that we were talking about. Very good. So I, just basically starting out in the last year and a half, um, just needing to add another layer to what we were doing within the context of the classroom. Uh, and so in uh, first grade, it looks like this. So this is Ed Emberley's drawing book of animals, and he has multiple versions of that book. And he's the guy that does the fingerprints, and you draw and add other little details. Um, but this is all shape-based drawing. Um, and it's great for my first graders and stuff because they are learning how to take a complex object and break it down into rec recognizable geometric shapes and then draw what they want to do. So we have a couple of projects designed for them that focus drawing in this way, uh, especially if we're talking about cave art, then there's, uh, in the book he has a couple of sections on drawing like deer and moose and camels, and they kind of all have the same body structure and shape, you just gotta change out the details, um, or the proportion of the parts if you're doing a giraffe. Um, and so they're finding good success in that, because at the end, okay, does what you have in your paper, we've talked about it, does it look like what it's supposed to be looking, looking like? And so. Um, that's a win for, for them. Uh, we've, there's another section on birds and just how to draw a general bird. And again, we can change out all the proportions and the different parts of the bird, whether it's a, a water bird or not like that. And so we use Charlie Harper, um, who is a, a U.S. illustrator who does uh, highly abstract uh, um, artwork around animals. And so this is a real natural fit uh, for them. But just trying to work on those skills and those shape building skills and connecting those ideas um, is what that's for. This book is over in the bookstore. In the bookstore, they did get a few copies in if you wanted to grab one of those. Um, and then from second grade up the next few years, uh, this is Mark Kistler. I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Kistler. He's been in doing arts mostly, mostly on public television stations for over 30 years. Um, I've had uh, a a rela not a friendship, but a, a good working relationship with Mark for about 20 years. Uh, now and so this is draw3d.com and um, <clears throat> an individual membership uh, annually is two hundred dollars. I never pay two hundred dollars because <laughs> because at Christmas time they'll mark it all the way down to fifty bucks and I can handle fifty bucks, which gives me access to like three hundred different drawing um, uh, videos that he's done uh, through the years. And I focus mostly upon these these mini marshmallow lessons. They're really, really good, just kind of simple ideas. You can see overlapping here. We can see some contour drawing over here. Um, we do get into some kind of 3D type thing. So basically, ultimately, basically, it's learning how to do 2D pers uh, two point perspective, but we're just cheating, all right? We're not using rulers or doing the orthogonal back in the distance or anything like that. Um, and so they pick, the, pick those up really, really well. Um, I do not show them vi the videos. I do this live. We do a draw along. So using an Elmo, I'm just there uh, working with pencil on the screen for them and then checking on what they're doing from time to time. And instead of this being done in blocks, I usually do about four drawings with them uh, per session. And then we'll go back to what we're working on as far as um, art production is concerned, the projects for two or three sessions, and then we'll come back and draw some more like that. But that's hitting kind of the second and third grade there. Mark doesn't sequence stuff like I think they should be sequenced a little bit, but this really helps hit my second and third graders where they where they are. Um, so these are some of their drawings. So this is uh, three scoops of ice cream. So we see overlapping and some contouring. There's actually some shading, nook and cranny shading going on there. Um, and then the bottom ones are related to, so uh, that is a whale of a tail of a tail of a whale, is what that drawing is. And then jillions of jiggling jellyfish uh, there. Um, so I'm excited about the success, but we're just learning how to do uh, four shortened circles. Mm -hmm. How do I take this and turn it in space so that it creates depth? And that's really what Mark's whole process is about, is learning how to draw with depth. And then uh, for fourth grade and up, so this is Mark's first book called Draw Squad. And um, for a number of years, I've just put together a packet um, of 10 pages, and I just teach the first 10 pages. He has a list of 12 Renaissance words that we use for drawing to learn how to draw with depth, and I've whittled that down to 10. So these are my top 10 depth 
drawing devices from the Renaissance to learn how to draw in 3D. Um, that usually gets done in two five session session settings with my fifth fourth graders. Um, but we're going to break that apart. We're going to actually begin to integrate it more into what's uh, going on. And again, those are just um, out of every lesson. There are probably five or six drawings, and I just picked three or four just in time wise. It is time consuming to make sure everybody's doing this little part and I don't get to get up and look. I'm just trusting that they're doing and we talk about the next session of things as a whole that they need to learn how to do and to do more. But you know it's working and you know that they're getting it when their artwork, other artwork that they're doing and you see it and you see those things in it. Mm -hmm. uh, especially their um, kind of their free draw time kind of things like that. So these things are beginning to filtrate into their thinking and their way of drawing and that's great. Um, and then from, so that carries me through, uh, through sixth grade. Um, if you do get this book, because it's over there too, uh, if you want to know more, I'm actually going through and putting together a sequence. And so I think there is a, a definite sequence. It is easier for my kids to draw for certain circle and cylinders and things like that than it is for them to draw a foreshortened square and a cube or a rectangular prism. That's a different skill. Uh, so I'm kind of splitting them out and progressively getting more complicated as we go along, hopefully using the rounder type projects for my fourth graders and some of my fifth graders and then the others for sixth graders as well. Uh, when we get to junior high, um, I introduced this a couple of years ago. This is just a set of lessons off of Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, there's a lot of things that Whitney Panetta, um, what was it called? Yeah, Look Between the Lines is kind of her store there and we've had good success with that with my junior hires I actually did it with my freshman high schoolers as well one year so everything on that side is what she did and everything on this side is is my kids and so, so the backpack drawing was really really good and when they got to doing gritting and learning how to add values into the face um, super super successful and then like I said this is the third year of doing that so now I have high schoolers who are doing this type of work as well, just transferring those ideas of values, you know, in other other ways. So, but there's one more thing we need to do. <laughs> and I am advocating that we adopt uh, an atelier model. And Ian and I had talked about this, that's what he's already doing. Um, so he could take over from me if you wanted to right now. <laughs> Um, but atelier is simply the word for um, for studio. Oh, I forgot this. So the difference between what we're doing progressively, a modern day class celebrates artistic individualism and originality above all else, often to the neglect of art history. Mm -hmm. And yet, just like we as Christians stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, artistically we need to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And we've abandoned that mm -hmm. in most cases. Mm -hmm. So the atelier model attempts to recapture um, that as well. So here's a cast drawing of someone just doing it before their atelier training and then after a year of atelier training. Wow. So yep, French word for, for studio. So basically we're just recapturing really a 19th century way of drawing that even the great masters used to draw from as well in which you have a master teacher, a master artist and you have students who come into the studio as an apprentice and they learn underneath this particular master teacher, uh, artist, um, and a lot of it is based on doing, uh, doing copy work. Um, so we have barred drawings that come at us from, uh, from France. So students begin by copying these lithographs or these engravings to learn the technique and to learn aesthetics. Um, great quote from Van Gogh. So he wrote to his brother about copying plates from one of, this, one of those books. Well, it, bark plates is what he was, that's what he was copying from. He said, careful study and the constant and re repeating copy of Bark's exercises have given me an insight into figure drawing. I learned to measure and to see and to look for the broad outline so that, thank God, what seemed utterly impossible to me is gradually becoming possible now. I no longer stand as helpless before nature as I used to be. Um, and so the ultimate 
goal of these exercises, though, is not this subservient invitation, but really a development of skill so that you have the freedom to do what you want to do. Um, from there, uh, students would go into uh, cast drawings, so um, learning directly from pieces or parts of great works of sculpture and working under a single light source that's stationary and unchanging. Again, developing the ability to be able to see values and to, quote, uh, turn the form. Uh, from there, then traditionally, you would be welcomed into the life drawing class and welcomed into there um, because really that's kind of the benchmark or has been the benchmark of classical, classical education in, in the past. Um, is drawing the human form, so that really is the focal point of the programs. Um, this unflinching accuracy combined with the knowledge of design. Um, but you got to figure out what you're going to do with all the nudes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I have a 16-year-old son who's in my classes, and that's very top of mind for me as well it is also with the young ladies who are in the class as well, because they are just as susceptible. We, we think it's okay to show a shirtless male, but not so much a shirtless female form, and so you've got to work that out <laughs> with you and you know what your school. Um, and then it does translate into cast painting. Again, the great thing is, is this is all about just values. So I've learned how to draw values, and now I'm learning how to manipulate paint and paint values and then there for the still life painting which I'm working with a limited palette now warms and cools and then eventually getting to the figure and portrait painting so that's kind of the capstone of that whole mode of education um, maybe, maybe it's kind of a senior project in which they're doing a portrait or a figure drawing uh, painting of someone um, so how do we do that uh, for me it began here uh, with Myron Barnstone and his DVDs. I encourage you to go onto YouTube and look him up. Um, uh, he's an excellent teacher, but he is a piece of work. Uh, <laughs> uh, very much, very much so. Um, uh, through, He's not with us anymore, um, but there is a set of 10 lessons on DVD that's like four and a quarter. Uh, I picked them up on eBay for a hundred bucks. Um, and they're good, they're helpful. Um, but he's just this unrelenting step-by-step -step learning how to draw. And for me, I need that. And so uh, there's some things that are there that will be helpful for me as far as uh, incorporating this into the classroom and leading my students to do this. Uh, the other one here, this is called the School of Atelier Arts. Uh, this is run by Mandy Tice, T-H-E-I-S. Um, Mandy studied with Juliette Aristides, who's an atelier teacher on the West Coast, and Juliette studied, studied under Barnstone as well. And, and really what that's what this is, is there is this history of master artist to student, to master artist to student, to master artist to student. And there's a one, and I haven't been able to find it, but I saw it once. Basically, from now through the past, they've charted back these multiple lineages uh, of, of master artist and student training, uh, mm -hmm. that there's this ongoing connection. It's kind of like a remnant <laughs> for, for the church kind of thing. Uh, Mandy was connected with uh, the, the Da Vinci Initiative, um, in which it had some helpful uh, tools available for you. I think that's defunct now, because most of what she's offering, and there's some places for some... Um, some learning tools for you to go get and to download, and it's basically what used to be over on, on the other other site. Um, so that's of, of help there as well. And then for us um, and for me um, is that they do have a Master's of Art in Studio Art that is available that will teach you to become that master uh, artist. And here at College of the Ozarks, uh, if you're on faculty, even in the School of the Ozarks, you are a college faculty. You've been assigned simply to the laboratory school. And so there's an amount of professional development and moving up in rank that is required of you. So I only have a bachelor's degree in studio art. Um, and so um, I'm launching. 
into a master's degree, uh, hopefully this summer. Um, it's a great program from what I've been look, looked at. It's six weeks over three years. So you go and it's intensive drawing and painting for six weeks and then you come back and do it again and you do it one more time. Uh, the nice thing is, is that two of those weeks, you can do those at distance. And so that's gonna be helpful um, because I have access to studio space here on the, on the campus. But the last year you have to go and do it in, per, in person and you get to choose. Am I going to do it in New Jersey City with Mandy? Or am I going to do it at the Florence Academy of Art in Florence, Italy? I'm going to Italy, all right? Uh, we hope so. We hope so. So this is kind of our journey. It is my journey. Um, and so if it helps you in some way, then God bless you. Back to Wesley. Here. At the college, yep, at Hard Work, yep. yep. Um, I was just uh, seeing a, one of the points you made about master teachers and pupils and students was very much the same point that Kevin Clark made this morning, right? Yep. Um, it's, it's good if uh, the student can see the, the benefit of finding a, a, a teacher that's very capable of, of teaching truth, but the teacher needs to open their door and make it accessible for them, right? And so that's very much the same scenario. Okay, so continuing on with vocal music here, um, I want to look at a section here, being doers of the word in culture and beyond. And one of the points that I want to talk about is this attitude of singing within the cracks. And uh, Kent Young, who is the K-12 music instructor at the Oaks in Spokane, Washington, he's a very good colleague of mine and a mentor. And he and I both went through the same Kodai certification program in Moscow, Idaho, uh, the Chen and I Music Summer Institute. Chen and I, right, led Israel in, in singing music and singing in the choir. And um, that's a fantastic program because they teach you the Kodai philosophy within the context of the ACCS mindset, right, which is, which is pretty important. Uh, there are a lot of Kodai programs, but that don't have that mindset of teaching music uh, well, let alone from a religious perspective, right? And so it's nice to have that within the framework of, of a believing framework. So Chen and I Music Institute. Um, okay, so anyway, singing within the cracks. We want to make sure that we meet students where they are and then take them to where they ought to be. Calvin Stapart, along with the church fathers, encouraged regular singing of the psalms and hymns in corporate and personal lives. Um, um, Yes. Um, he said, we need to teach them to our children and find ways and occasions to use them regularly. As I mentioned earlier, we do Psalm 117 and we do a couple of other, other psalms. We started Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And then some of the other teachers also teach psalms to uh, musical melodies and whatnot. Okay? And so there are multiple opportunities throughout the school day to sing songs or to do activities in a musical manner. Beginning the day, we begin the day with a patriotic hymn, a, um, a religious patriotic hymn. Well, a, a hymn is religious, excuse me. So patriotic hymn. So God bless America, right? It's patriotic, but it's also a hymn. Um, and then we, uh, we can begin our classes. They can start with a sung greeting. Hello, class. Something, right? Hello, teacher. <laughs> yep, that's an example. But I've, I've recorded some examples of our teachers here that do that, so you can kind of see that within the context of, of the classroom. Uh, so I'll play that pretty soon here. Um, there can be, uh, or, you know, uh, oh, we start our faculty meetings with a verse of a hymn. And so there are a variety of opportunities to start out the class with on a musical note. Uh, yes, musical note. <laughs> So uh, the prayer at lunch, mm -hmm. we, we do, will sometimes sing a prayer at lunch. And so I want to practice this with you right now. Um, just repeat after me. We give thanks, we give thanks for all God's blessings. For all God's blessings. We, praise him we praise him with all our hearts. With all our hearts. Amen. Amen. Right. So if I sing the melody, you're going to echo it back to me, okay? So get ready. You're going to sing a little. You might not know you're going to participate, but here you go, okay? Listen first. Here we go. Ready? Me first and then you. We give thanks, we give thanks for, all God's blessings. for all God's blessings. We give thanks, we give thanks for, all God's blessings. for all God's blessings. We praise Him, we praise him with all our hearts. With all our hearts. Amen. 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 
Very simple, just echo, repeat style, and that was a prayer, right? So you can do that. And we will have the sixth graders will sing for the fifth and, and fourth graders, or there'll be a brave a three third graders that will sing for the third, second, and first graders during lunchtime, right? So that's a very simple way to do uh, singing within the cracks, that music uh, at lunchtime. And then we will often, we'll, we'll, every day, we're going to end our day with the, the doxology. And again, I have a, a clip of that, what that looks like at our school. So we do that. So these are all examples of the glue that holds together the cultural fabric of a school. And practically, because music is a difficult language, students must be immersed in it from the youngest years to achieve a useful level of mastery by the time they graduate. This attitude of mu musical immersion is not distracting. It's not weird. It's just what they do. God's word, which, are t which is tightly wound up in melodies and choruses, will be hidden in our hearts to distill and simmer over time. And the melodies act as a structure by which to see the text and to bring them up and recall them in our memory more easily. And, um, and that is ultimately the goal. We want God's word to be in our hearts, right? And um, there's another half hour throughout the day that we call memory time. And that's when kindergarten through sixth grade are all brought together in one room, the commons, one of, uh, one of the locations for our sessions in, in the lower school. And so um, we do a whole variety of things uh, during that time. Memory time is when Mrs. Carey does it. And then cantabile is when I do it. Cantabile is Latin for to sing. And so we, uh, we get to share that time time with the students and it's very special I'll do more sing sing uh, driven activities she will also do singing too but I'll be focused more on maybe the technique maybe uh, describing something um, we were talking about uh, uh, Harkness moments right this is where you have students that drive uh, conversations with other students um, that's uh, I'll do that in the middle of a hymn during cantabile we'll sing a phrase and I'll say wait pause what did, what did you say and then they'll repeat it back to me like what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? And, and this kindergarten, well, Mr. Saunders, um, yeah, and then Harkness moment, boom, right there. And it was in the middle of our memory time, or cantabile. And so um, I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit of that very soon. But first, I want to show you, these are what some of the teachers do here. And uh, this is some of the musical moments of what the teachers do. Okay, so here we go. Check this out. Movement, kinesthetic. <laughs> Mrs. Martin, she's in the back of the room here. This is her second grade class. Spoken and then sung. Third grade. Passing out a paper, name and number. It doesn't have to be quiet, you can sing. <laughs> Getting in line, lining up in the hall. This is second grade. attention, talking, so there you go, a couple examples of what 
what you can do with musical elements, and they can be rhythmic elements, not just musical. So to close out this session here, um, what, what do we do, right? What, what are we going to do? We are training up children who, like us, are temples of God. These temples are to be filled with His Word and Spirit. It is crucial that we have an attitude of active engagement in singing His praises. There also should not be a separation between the choir singers and everyone else. We all, all the lands, as God tells us in His Word, are called to praise God in song. As a student body comes to share a collection of songs and melodies and a spirit decor follows, it's the kind of culture that can start in school, travel to the home, and beyond. If we do our job as educators, there will be pushback as a result of living in a way that is Christ-centric and staunchly counter-cultural. As image bearers of the Most High God, His glory demands our best. And in teaching image bearers, who will one day be parents and clergymen and ultimately a royal priesthood and citizens of a kingdom of the kingdom of heaven, the pursuit of building a Christian and classical music program with excellence and beauty will be one of the most important things we will ever do. So in conclusion, in conclusion I'll briefly discuss some of the challenges that, that we face that are unique to our scenario and uh, what we're doing to get through them. So the first one was how to grow a love and affection for singing and music and life in God's sovereignty uh, can be challenging. The eighth grader just walks through the door. I want this eighth grader to love singing, but they are... Um, uh, they just got back from, uh, you know, being grounded, or they're questioning their faith right now, or uh, you know, there are a lot of issues going through everyone's, all these students, right? So we have to just know that, okay, we're just going to set before them a platter that is just inviting to the eyes, and let God do the work of changing the heart, right? You can't force everything. We just have to trust God in His sovereignty. Another one, how to handle musical influences of the pop culture. It will always be there. There will be phones. They're not going away. So what do you do? Well, you feed them the things that are good when they're young, so that when they get older, they naturally want those things. You can't, you can't remove them from the dangers of this world. But what you can do is you can strengthen their desire for the good, and hopefully the, the, the not-so-good will just not be sought after, because they, they just know. They were brought up that way, right? You set a, tra set a child straight, he will not weave from his path in the future. Musically speaking, the family, church, and school cultures are often not aligned. When they go home, they're getting something totally different from their parents. Their parents didn't have their education that we had or that they are getting, right? They think something very much differently about music. Um, maybe they go to a church that has contemporary worship, and then we're trying to do something more um, classical or more traditional at the school or vice versa. There are, are a bunch of different scenarios, and so we just have to keep that in mind. It's okay. You have to see them where they are and gently apply pressure with love. You start where they are, and you gently apply pressure with love, and you teach them, right? And at the end of the day, always trusting God to mold the heart. Parents need training just as much as the children. Oftentimes, you have to educate our parents just as much as the children do, because they don't know better, right? The teachers need to already possess or be willing to, team, uh, to learn a basic proficiency in singing. One cannot teach what one does not know. It's not hard for teachers in other grades to learn these uh, small musical elements or just have the willingness to, to say some of their commands in a rhythmic fashion. And uh, it's not hard. So you just have to have a willingness. All right, this is a final clip just showing a little bit of what the classroom looks like. And um, this is my music classes. Sammy walking down the alley has to do an action. The second one has to follow and copy the action. How, how funny can you get, you know? We're using instruments here. We'll use instruments every now and then. Fun activity. Again, joyful music is the goal. They want to be a joyous experience. Here we are work, using worksheets. They have to write down the, the rhythms on their worksheets. We have a solo singer singing solfege. Bow Wow Wow, the song that you saw. This is a dance, and dancing is a fantastic thing to do with your, with your students. We should all do more dancing. All do more dancing. <laughs> 
Here's a work worksheet. I zoom in on it so you can see what it looks like. So they're learning rhythms. So this, a, so this is a game activity. The geese have to get past the wolf. <laughs> this is memory time. Mrs. Carey. Catechisms being sung. This is the kindergarten class singing many of the catechisms to melodies. <laughs> Concert playing instruments and singing in the gymnasium. <laughs> High school choir. An African classic. Christmas program. We always repeat Luke 2 from memory with motions every Christmas. This is a fun choir workshop we did with two other schools that joined us. We brought in a clinician. And the school is the audience song that we did. So Great tenor. I want to use his voice. Chapel. A very musical family that's leading us in Go Tell on the Mountain for one of the songs for our chapel on Friday. This is a musical... A variety showcase that we did last year, Hamilton. <laughs> and doxology at the end of the day in the hallway. We try to end all of our concerts and all of our school-wide activities with the doxology chapel on Fridays, always in the doxology. Thank you so much. I don't think we have time for questions, but find us in the hallway and we'll help any way we can. Thank you.